Folks, One Rental at a Time is a different YouTube channel because we bring on experts from across the area. Here we have Taylor from Life Goal Investments, a 10-year Wall Street veteran who has seen lots and lots of different things. How are you doing, Taylor? I'm doing great. This is uh, interesting economic times. We're in interesting stock market times that we're in. Yeah, one of my experts like to talk about uh, good times never last, bad times never last. I don't think it is a stretch to say we are exiting one and entering another. Given where you are at, what you've been doing the last 10 or 15 years, talk to us about how business cycles end because there is a kind of one, two, three process. They happen at different rates and different times at different speeds, but it, they all kind of go through this process. So how do business cycles end from your experience? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it does seem to be a pretty systematic three-step process that plays out. So the forward, the leading economic indicator, as we all know, is the stock market. The stock market reacts to things before they actually happen because it has the foresight of doing so. And so the first thing that happens is the stock market enters a traditional bear market. So a bear market, as you probably know, is a fall from its peak by 20%. So the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow all entered. Actually, I don't know if the Dow did, but anyway, the, certainly the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 did. They entered a bear market in 2022 where the S&P drew down 25% from its peak. The NASDAQ drew something like 33% down from its peak. And, and don't, don't quote me on the Dow, but I don't actually know that it entered that traditional bear market. But I think as we look at the stock market as a whole, the barometer is always the S&P 500 because it's the most inclusive, the largest 500 companies or thereabout in the US. And it drew down from you know a peak down 25%. So that is absolutely included in that traditional conversation of a bear market. So that is step one. Okay. So I think everybody can go back. You can pull up your charts and see that we uh, we did do that. We were off 25% on the S&P. So wh what happens next? Step two is an earnings recession. So earnings what is recession. What is, think, what is that? Yeah. So think about that just like your traditional GDP economic recession, where you have two negative year over year quarters of, of uh, earnings growth. So earnings actually contracting year over year for two straight quarters. So the fourth quarter of 2022, which has already been reported, that did show economic contraction, or I'm sorry, earnings contraction, earnings went negative year over year. And as we look right now, as we enter essentially the bulk of earnings season, we've had a couple companies report, but the mass of it is going to be reporting over the next three weeks. It is anticipated by the average analyst estimate on Wall Street that we will see a contraction of earnings by 6.8%. So as long as they aren't grossly, terribly off, that's going to be two negative quarters of earnings growth. And there is your earnings contraction, your earnings recession. That is step two. Yeah. So we're going to stay tuned for the next three weeks. I think this is something my experts have been talking about for a while now. Uh, yeah. I, th I think it's around the corner again. You know, you may you may have some companies like JP Morgan that can sit on their hands and make, you know, twenty billion dollars with net interest margin, but that's not going to be most of the S P five hundred. Um, so okay, let's assume that's step two, which we get a check mark in three, maybe four weeks. What happens next? So the third step is your traditional economic recession, your economic contraction. And there's two parts to this. You know, conventional, uh, you know, online social media wisdom has said it just is two negative quarters of GDP growth. And people say, we're already in a recession. Well, we're not technically in a recession right now because there's two components of it. So we did get the two negative quarters of GDP growth last year. And then it kicked the trend and went back up at the end of the year. So we did check that part of the box. But the part, of the, the other part that we did not check is the pickup in unemployment. So that is the other piece of the equation that you need to see start to move up to traditionally have the NBER say, okay, we are actually in a real technical recession right now. And just for context, because I think that this is something that people say, this has never happened before. We've never seen two negative quarters of GDP growth without an economic recession being um, officially announced. That's not true. We did see it in 1947. And then on the other side of the coin, in 2001, we had two, we did not have two negative quarters of GDP growth, and we did get qualified as an official recession. So yeah. let me, let me just shut up there and, and you can kind of no, digest that a little right. better. Yeah, I, I did a lot of it, or I tried to do a lot of education on this last year, right? Uh, again, with an economics degree and having kind of gone deep in this, there, there are rules of thumb that get adopted that are pretty good. 
two quarters of negative GDP being one example for the masses. But there's actually four or five metrics that go into calculating a recession, of which GDP, negative GDP growth is only one, right? Jobs, uh, industrial production, there's all of these things. But the masses, their heads blow up when you think Correct. of all of those characteristics. Yeah, 1947, 1948, it's happened before. Um, also, it doesn't have to be two quarters, a la um, the COVID recession. The COVID recession was like three months. So, yep. I mean, the NBA, the, the economic form, can, and they always call it late, right? It'll be nine months after it starts when they call these things. So uh, it, it's pretty interesting. But yeah, I think, I think what we're really pointing at is business cycles die kind of this way. And, it's, and it, it, it's it's no huge question mark as to why they die. What happened here was inflation started to run away and the Fed had to rein in inflation by yanking interest rates higher at a historic rate. You cannot expect the companies and the overall economy, which are all a function of the underlying companies, to continue to maintain their pace of growth when their cost of debt quadruples or quintuples or whatever the number is. They can't go out and hire that next person because they don't know that the margin is, okay, we have to pay a 5% interest rate on the loan that we have to take to hire this person. Are they going to create 5% additional profit or additional revenue to make it profitable in order to hire them or build out that factory or whatever it may be? Yeah, did you see what Jamie Dimon said about floating rate debt over the last 48 hours? No, I didn't. What did he say? So I think he's building on a famous Warren Buffett quote, right? Warren Buffett talks about when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. Right. Jamie Dimon, and I actually wrote it down. Uh, interest rates are going to be higher for longer. Floating rate debt will undress problems in the economy. It's, it's an interesting comment because I, I think I will – quasi refute that okay um now now i'm not saying wholeheartedly across the board but the biggest one of the biggest reasons that the economic contraction hasn't been more significant than it was in earlier times when we raised interest rates is because of the lack of floating rate debt on the biggest debt instrument that we have which are mortgages in the united states i believe and you might be able to correct me on this i believe floating rate mortgages account for about 12 percent of current mortgage rates Whereas back pre-2008, it was about 40%. So when the Fed raised rates, it affected the biggest bill you have every single month as a consumer because it took your interest rates higher on your mortgages. Whereas now, it does not. You are locked at that 3% mortgage, which is also why we don't have any supply of houses because no one's going to sell their house and then jump to a 7% or 65 or 6 whatever it is right now, from 3% and see that doubling of the mortgage rate and doubling of their bill. Yeah, so actually, I think you're agreeing with Jamie. Jamie is, Jamie is basically saying, he didn't say this, this is my interpretation, residential housing is going to be fine. So the numbers, again, I do look at this stuff a lot. No, fixed rate debt, fixed rate debt loan origination coming out of 2021, 98% of loans were fixed. Wow, so, wow. So 2% wow. were variable. That yep. is so and essentially that says on my number, because I'm pretty sure my number's right at 12% of outstanding. That is old vintage debt. Yeah, old point. vintage. Yeah, yeah, right. And again, let's not forget roughly 40% of homes are owned free and clear, which you know, they don't have any debt. But what, what, so again, if we could take the largest mortgage, which is now fixed for 30 years, all of that, Jamie is really pointing at commercial real estate. Right, right. Right. And unfortunately, because this is, I mean, they give you go back, I got receipts on my channel. Uh, commercial debt started to copy the sins of 06, which was shorter and shorter term, more variable, interest-only components, bad assumptions, just debt coverage. I mean, just wacky stuff. We already saw it. You probably didn't see this, but it hit my radar. There was a 3,200-unit apartment complex in Houston, Texas that was bought for, again, I think it was $260 million a year ago. Ouch. Ouch. The general partners raised a hundred million dollars in private equity or private debt, LP, limited partners. Yep. Uh, so they had an underlying loan of like 200 million or 190 or something. They yep. foreclosed in less than a year. They sold Yikes. the debt for 14% discount. So they, the bank lost 14%. The LPs lost 100% like that. This, this is floating rent debt coming back to bite people. This is bad operators. And of course, on my channel, we always talk about billionaire Barry. 
Barry Sternlick from Starwood. Yeah, He's yeah. come on CNBC and with PowerPoint slides talking about the Fed has to cut rates. So I'm guessing billionaire Barry is a little interest rate sensitive, maybe a little bit illiquid and needs some help. But that's just my have, wild ass. Have we guess. heard anything similar out of Elon Musk? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have personal exposure in commercial real estate um, and we have a five. We have a 20 year note and it resets every five years. Thankfully for us, ours reset just so we didn't catch the bottom by any stretch of the imagination, but we caught it about halfway up on the reset to where it has gotten. And I do think, and history tells us this, and history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. When you hit a recession, mortgage rates, interest rates will come back down. It's just the natural progression of how economics work. And so um, I, I, I do think we're going to get a reset back lower because I do think that we are going to experience a real economic contraction and a recession, um, but that doesn't happen overnight. And these issues are going to continue to play out. Um, I just hope they aren't as widespread as, as some are forecasting. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're going to see with commercial real estate is it's not going to be this systemic event. And that is kind of just like the building we talked about in Houston. Uh, the the LTV, as it's often called, loan to value on commercial is not 97, 98, 99, 103% like residential loans have been in the past. Uh, when they take haircuts, it'll be 14%, which they can take out of their reserve funds. But you're, if you're an equity holder, you're a limited partner. A lot of you, many of you have lost your money already and you don't even know it. Right. And uh, But I think that's a really important point when you think about the broad economy as a whole. Who is this affecting? This is not affecting Main Street, at least in a, in a massive way, right? Main Street might own some REITs, um, et cetera, but that's even the high end of Main Street, right? This right. is affecting folks that are, are, are probably well off to begin with. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that's not a bad thing. It's an no. accredited investor that has deep pockets and is going to take it on the chin a little bit here. And you know what? This is maybe a, a shakeup, an awakening of you have to understand risk and reward. If someone... Some of these real estate deals, and you know this better than me, the promises they were making oh, on IRR horrible. were absurd. 20% with very little risk is what they were saying. And I'm looking at myself going, who is willing to sign up for something if you're educated and say, I'm going to almost guarantee you a 20% rate of return? That's absurd. Yeah, I saw I saw many. And this is what caused me to start warning people over a year ago that this was coming. So again, we got receipts on this channel. I hope you listen. If you're already in one of these, I'm sorry. Taylor, where can people find you? You put out amazing stuff. Uh, we just announced Apple doing 4.15%. You got a video coming out today. People must watch. Yes, it will. So uh, follow us at Life Goal Investments on Instagram and on uh, TikTok as well. Just they're, they're one minute videos. So they're, they're some of this stuff truncated down and try to be a little punchier. Let's just be clear. He sometimes gets a little ranty, which are the ones no, I really This one's like. a rant, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> there we, I like it when you rant. Thanks, buddy.